Neymiş efendim? Türklüğümüzü yaşayamayacak. Neymiş? Türklüğümüzde gurur duymayacakmış. Ulan soysuz var. Ulan vatan hainleri. Siz görüyor musunuz lan benim Türklüğümü nasıl yaşadığımı? Ahlaksızlar, şerefsizler. Yürü gidin lan bu. This is Turkey, now spelled like this, home to many of the world's ancient and modern superpowers. The Romans, Byzantines, Persians, and Ottomans all center their empires in one way or another around the Anatolian Peninsula, which makes up modern-day Turkey. Turkey is a mysterious country to the west and to the east as well. Modern-day Turkey acts as a middleman between the neighboring realms of Europe, Russia, and the Middle East. It's for this reason where it's quite hard to predict how Turkey will evolve and who its friends will be in the future. After all, Turkey is allied to the West now, but seems to be slipping away every day, pushing closer to less Western nations. It's somewhat of a meme that Turkey will end up as a great superpower one day, but recent economic and political turmoil has put that into question. Turkey is notoriously hard to predict, but still, what is the future of Turkey? To start to understand Turkey, you must first look at its geography. The shape of Turkey is, as you can see, a rectangle. It's a little symbolic of the direction trade and goods have flowed throughout Turkey historically, if you use your imagination. What is not in our imagination though is when you zoom out, you can see who the trade flowed by. On Turkey's west is Europe and on its east is the Middle East, South Asia and way out there, China. Turkey's position as the middle of the Middle East has historically made them the middleman in global trade like during the Silk Road era, and as the middleman it is easy to get rich and expand your influence outwards. Something else though has made it fairly easy to expand outwards, the physical makeup of this peninsula. A topographic map of the region shows Turkey is bounded on its east by the Armenian highlands with the Pontic Mountains to the north and the Taurus Mountains on its south. Along with the Black Sea, Aegean Sea, and Mediterranean Sea surrounding it, this leaves Turkey in an extremely defendable position with a hilly, semi-arid interior to build a civilization. Of course, this also means if any invaders can break through the natural defenses, it's pretty easy to take the rest of the country, which has happened plenty of times throughout history. This essentially leaves only two parts of Turkey open to an attack. The southeastern part of Anatolia, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers create a pocket of flat land outside of the mountains by neighboring Syria, and Thrace, the region of Turkey considered to be European, separated from the Anatolian peninsula. Although, the border is somewhat defendable by the Marich River, so at least there's that. It is cut off by the Sea of Marmara and Bosphorus Strait, isolating it from the mainland Turkey. The nearby sea and flatland does make it some of the best agricultural land in the nation though, turning the weakness into one of Turkey's most productive areas. You can see by looking at this map of its density, there are so many Turks crowded around the Sea of Marmara. It makes sense, as a place on earth that connects both Asia and Europe and the Black Sea and Mediterranean seas and has a natural strait running through it, it makes a city which is placed there likely the best place city on earth. This has proven to be the case 15 million people can tell you, as Istanbul, currently sitting in its place, is the largest city in Europe or the Middle East depending on where you put it. Essentially, whoever was in control of this city could control trade between the entire region and make themselves a world power. This is a power Turkey has not forgotten. Geography has blessed Turkey into making it a trade-based world power and has worked multiple times in the past. Can modern Turkey live up to the former rulers of Anatolia? It's important to remember that Turkey and the Turks living there are not an ancient people group. There were ancient cultures in Turkey and it's very likely the first civilization on earth sprung up in modern day Turkey, but the Turks who live there and their culture is only around a thousand years old, which sounds like a long time, but Turkey has a 10,000 year old history, so the latest owners are fairly new. And it's important to note this because unlike in neighboring Greece, whose people have lived there since the ancient era, the people living in ancient Turkey were replaced multiple times. Let's go through some of the replacements that have happened through Anatolian history. The first recorded peoples who lived in Anatolia were the Hattians and Hurrians, eventually replaced by the Hittites in 2000 BC. The southeastern Hittites were pushed out by the Assyrians, rivaled by the kingdom of Van to the north. The Phrygians replaced the Hittites in 1200 BC, followed by the Sumerians in 700 BC. It was around this time when the Greeks settled the western coast of Anatolia. 
Persia decided to invade in the 6th century BC, followed by a fight by the Greeks, and later Alexander the Great conquered the peninsula. Anatolia was turned Greek and was the first major area Christianity spread to under Roman rule. Later, Rome split in two, with the eastern half becoming the Byzantine Empire centered around the peninsula. This lasted until the 11th century. The Byzantines were eventually weakened by constant fighting with the Muslim world and in a fairly swift migration, the Seljuk Turks came into Anatolia. It was now when Turkey turned Turkish and changed from the Christian to the Muslim world. The Seljuks were then destroyed by the Mongols who just wanted to conquer everything in their way. And out of the rubble came a bunch of small Turkish kingdoms. One in particular, the Ottomans, began growing and growing until it was quite large. Once the Ottomans took Constantinople, now Istanbul, in 1453, they cemented their place as a world power. The Ottomans exerted control over the Middle East, North Africa, the Caucasus, the Balkans, and much of Eastern Europe. The Ottomans reached their peak around the late 1700s and then began to decline. Modernization efforts were tried but they couldn't stop its fall. It didn't officially end until they ended up on the wrong side of World War I and were officially split up along arbitrary lines. While the peninsula was controlled by the Allied powers, a Turkish national movement headed by a man named Ataturk successfully drove away Allied forces through a war of independence. Ataturk became the first president of the new Republic of Turkey and liberalized the nation to a secular and modern state. Since then, there have been a couple of coups dealing with terrorists, the joining of NATO, and a liberalization of the economy to grow closer to Europe, which brings us to the modern day. I know that this is an extremely broad history of Turkey, however it deals with 4,000 years of history. What it shows though is that the Anatolian Peninsula has been replaced before by multiple people groups. I'm not saying that it will happen again, but I am saying that Turkey has historically been vulnerable. Why should that change? If the geography shows that Turkey is destined to be a major world power, and its history shows that its power comes in waves, what do its people and economy show? Turkey currently has 85 million residents, yet by 2060 that number will grow to 97 million and then start falling. This is a decent growth. 12 million in 40 years will not put too much stress on the country and it will likely not destabilize the country. The new people will make new jobs, new production, and new money to turn Turkey into a major regional power if it already isn't today. And with a median age of 31.5 years old, Turkey is neither too young nor too old to make significant gains within the next couple decades. But it is worth noting that Turkey's growth is not even. The fertility rate in the east is much, much higher than that of the west. This is because the west is more urbanized and developed than the east and it will be a focus of Turkey to balance the development throughout the country in the coming decades. Having an eastward population growth wouldn't be too bad as it is the least populated region of Turkey, however there is a problem. The east is not full of Turks, it is inhabited by Kurds. The Kurds are a large non-Turkish ethnic group making up around 10% of the total population, mostly concentrated in the east. For many years, the Kurds have fought for independence from Turkey, and for years, Turkey has denied it. It is absolutely not in Turkey's favor to lose a huge chunk of their country, especially in its most naturally defended part. But as the population of the East grows, so too will Kurdish separatism, likely resulting in even more turmoil in the East than there already is. It is uncertain whether this growth in population will boost the Turkish economy or cause political upheaval. It will probably end up being a combination of both. And the economy of Turkey sure looks like it needs a boost too. In general, the Turkish economy has grown at a tremendously fast rate, but in the past decade has fallen quite dramatically. Let's take a look at the overall economy first though. Turkey has the 20th largest economy on earth with a GDP of around 800 billion US dollars or around $10,000 per capita. It is a newly industrialized country and an emerging market to foreign powers. 21% of the labor force though still works in agriculture consisting of only 7.5% of GDP. Whereas the other 80% of people and 93% of the economy is made up of industry and services. In particular, manufacturing plays a key role in the development of Turkey, making products like automobiles, trains, defense products and steel. Construction has also been a big part of the nation's economy. But services account for most of the economy, mostly made up of finance, communication, tourism, and transportation. After all, they do link the west and east together, they might as well transport their goods too. Yet, in recent years, this economy has been in decline. 
During the last decade, its GDP growth rate has fallen from around 7% to 1% or 2%, and that was before the pandemic. Although the GDP didn't actually fall during the initial wave of COVID like many other nations did, it was still much lower than what the nation had seen. The migrant crisis of Syrian refugees fleeing from the Syrian civil war first caused economic panic in Turkey. Turkey had, and still has, the most refugees out of any nation on earth living in it, and they needed to integrate around 3.6 million Syrians into Turkish society, or at least keep them in until Syria became stable again. The wave of refugees coming in caused economic slowdown as they needed housing, food, and jobs for them. This caused an initial rise in the Turkish unemployment rate that has continued to rise to this day, but Turkey figured it out with the help of a deal made by the EU, and now only 2.5% of Syrian refugees still live in refugee camps. The other big economic crisis is a political one. The Turkish Lira, the national currency of Turkey, has lost its value at a crazy rate. 10 years ago, one US dollar was worth about two Turkish Liras. As of January of 2022, one dollar is worth about 14 liras. That's a seven times increase in only 10 years and it has caused the country to panic. Along with the other issues of falling GDP and rising unemployment, the fallen currency rate is causing inflation to rise, borrowing costs to go up, and it's becoming much more common for people to default on their debts. When a currency is depreciated, the best thing to do is to raise their interest rates on borrowing money so people will take out less loans. However, Turkey doesn't do that. Instead, Turkey has actually lowered interest rates from 19% to 14%, causing this crisis to blow up even more than it should have. And the Turkish government seems to double down on this policy, firing many top officials who try to raise interest rates or report statistics to show the problem. It's unclear whether Turkey will continue to take the low interest method and keep having its economy essentially be ruined, or whether Turkey will raise the interest rates and try to resume their tremendously fast growing economic status. Let's summarize so far. Turkish geography is good, Turkish history is iffy, its demographics are great other than a certain part, and its economy was doing amazing until the last decade, but we still have one more thing to talk about. Turkey's friends, or partners, allies, enemies, and neighbors. Turkey is at the crossroads between the energy-rich East, areas like Arabia, Iran, and Russia, and the major consumer markets of the West, mainly Europe. Its primary strategy going into the future will almost certainly be trying to balance its relationships between these two sides in order to keep doing business with both sides and hopefully become more than just a regional power. It's working on mega projects like the Nabucco pipeline to physically transport energy from the east to European markets and political projects with the EU, Russia and Middle Eastern nations. Currently, Turkey is in NATO and has a free trade agreement with the European Union. This makes Turkey officially a Western ally, however it seems like every year Turkey is distancing itself from the West. For instance, it has bought Russian weapons at a time when Russia had just invaded Crimea and started to project power into the Black Sea near Turkey. It has beefed numerous times with another NATO state, Greece even destroying some Greek ships and planes, and has always been the odd one out in the alliance being the only Muslim Middle Eastern nation in NATO. Turkey still wants to keep ties with NATO though, officially condemning Russian interest in the Black Sea and upholding the NATO quota on defense spending. Tensions with Russia have also risen, being on opposite sides of recent wars like the Syrian Civil War and Nagorno-Karabakh War. Despite this and some other hostile skirmishes, Russia is still one of Turkey's largest trading partners and has signed a defense deal with Turkey. So it might seem like Turkey is getting further and further away from NATO, but in reality it is likely them trying to find more friends in the region for business purposes. And its Middle Eastern relations fluctuate even more than its European relationships do. As a Western ally, Turkey is affiliated with Israel. This has strained ties with many Islamic nations who see Israel as oppressing the Palestinian people. The main tie it has strained with Saudi Arabia's who used to be a Turkish friend. Their alliance with Israel, along with strains from the Arab Spring and Syrian war has caused their relationship to sour, but money must be made and Saudi Arabian oil still flows through Turkey to get to European markets, resulting in a half-enemy, half-partner relationship between the two nations. With Iran, the relationship is much smoother. Even though Iran condemns Turkey for allying with Israel, they seem to have the same foreign policy plans for the region. Both nations technically condemn US and Israeli intervention, want to see a weakened Saudi Arabia, and are large trading partners with each other. 
Turkey's shifting alliances are a sign that Turkey is trying to balance itself between its old allies to the west and hopefully new allies to the east, or at least a sign that no alliance is permanent to Turkey and that they are strong enough to make it on their own. Turkey is a country which has one of the most unpredictable futures on earth. Its geography creates a shell around which a bountiful nation can form, but its history shows that numerous different people groups have broken that barrier. Its demographics show a nation about to rise to prominence while its economy shows a stagnating country about to fall out of power, and its foreign relations are the result of all this mishmash in the Turkish system. Turkey itself does not know which way it wants to go. All it knows is it wants to be the middleman of the world. Turkey can make itself a successful regional power, all they have to do is leverage their position between the west and the east. But if Turkey truly wants to become a global power, then maybe it's time to stop sitting back and make a Turkish strategy.